I will call the Assembly Finance Committee meeting of April 6th to order at 5.32. Ms. Spiegel, will you please note our role? Thank you, Chair Treem. We have all Assembly members present in chambers besides Mayor Weldon and Assembly Member Smith. Assembly Member Smith is present virtually on Zoom and Mayor Weldon is absent. Thank you. Okay, approval of minutes. We have the minutes from our Saturday meeting on March 12th. Does anybody have any objections or corrections to make to those minutes? Seeing none, those are approved. Agenda topic A, summary of the FY23 proposed budget. Let's get started. Is this uh, Mr. Rogers? Thank you, Chair Treem. Um, I, um, you know, it's always interesting to start this process and just reflect on the work that's ahead of us um, before we dive right in. So many, many of you have experienced this before and some of you have not. And we have the next uh, maybe seven Wednesday nights to figure all this stuff out. And um, eventually you have to make a lot of decisions. Um, but fortunately for you tonight, you don't have to make any, I don't think. Um, tonight is just about getting yourself rooted in and um, coming to have a, a as good an understanding as you can of where we're starting with the budget, knowing that a lot more detail about various pieces will still come to you. Um, I sent you all a little, um, some guidance on how we would move forward. I think we'll do some of that tonight. We'll start with the manager's budget message and, and, and move forward from there and work through various pieces of the budget book and the packet. Um, I, I think it, even at the top of this process, I'll do this at the end of this process too, but I, I feel compelled to do it right now. Um, it may seem like I uh, uh, do a lot on the budget, and in some ways I do, and the manager also, and lots of city staff, but um, a huge amount of credit goes to, to Ms. Spiegel next to me um, for not only the mechanical production of the budget, which is extraordinarily complex, but um, just countless hours of really good detailed work with departments and administrative staff and directors trying to figure out uh, what departments are trying to accomplish in their budgets and um, just really in incredibly significant effort. But um, Ms. Spiegel is very talented and I'm thankful she's here and, and the budget's better for her efforts. So um, with that, uh, well, that's nice, look at that, I'm clapping. Clapping. Okay, this is nice. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's truly deserved. So thank you. Um, let's start on page 19 of the budget book. Um, I have tried this year to anchor the, uh, our discussion a little more in the budget book. I think, um, you know, the budget book is a little bit sacrosanct. Uh, it's not something we change lightly, but I think that we will um, make some changes to the structure of the budget book this year. So maybe the budget book that you go all get in June when we're done with our work will be a slightly different structure. Um, so some of the information that's included in the back of the budget book, I'd like to integrate more into the budget book itself. So we're going to try and do that. But on um, page 19, there's a manager's budget message. I commend any of you to this. I think anybody in the public who wants to read a little something and understand what the what we're working with in the budget. I really do think this is the best place to start. We put a lot of time into trying to come up with some narrative um, that makes sense um, for how we start the process and, and that's here. So a um, couple of important things about just where we are, you know, we have, we have this really considerable fund balance right now. That's the situation we find ourselves in. Um, and it really is federal money, you know, had we not had the significant uh, federal revenue that, that for the most part replaced general fund income, general fund revenue in the last couple of years, we would not have the fund balance we have today. In fact, if you had not um, taken fairly significant action to reduce city costs, you, we would have burned through all of fund balance. And, and I remember two years ago, we had that conversation. It, it was just a possibility that we would burn through tons of fund balance to get through this process. And that's not that would not have been the wrong thing. I mean, that's the reason fund balance is there to weather this kind of emergency. Um, so we were in a really, really good position. We didn't have to make um, any crazy decisions. And then lo and behold, we were able to continue providing city services generally like we had. Um, and at the same time, the federal government uh, did come in with really significant stimulus, including to local communities um, that, that kept us from, from, from having that result. So now we do, we, we continue to have, we've retained a sizable fund balance um, which now gives this assembly uh, future uh, further flexibility, um, which I think is uh, something to, in many ways to celebrate. That said, 
uh, I would have to believe that that level of federal support is behind us. Um, it's not to say that we won't see a little award here or there to come through from the state or another program still, um, but I think uh, looking forward, we should be trying to plan for a budget that pays for itself locally, um, which is really the way that we've always done budgeting. Um, this has been a, a very, very unusual two budget cycles uh, in that regard. So um, a couple of assumptions in the budget, you know, the budget generally assumes that the pandemic um, stays with us, but but shifts uh, toward an endemic that we manage not as a public health emergency, but as um, an aspect of public and personal health that we all do all the time for all kinds of things. So um, the, the budget doesn't forecast significant restrictions on gathering. It assumes that people will be able to um, that people will be able to come here as visitors and that they'll be able to be on tours and they'll be able to be um, in, in food and hospitality est establishments. So, so that's, that's the underlying assumption of the budget. Um, obviously, it also in, uh, forecasts a, a million passengers this summer, something a little more than that next summer. So that's, you know, the, the sort of the average for next fiscal year would be a little higher than a, a million passengers. Um, we you know, the, the manager may, may choose to speak a little bit about that tonight. We think that that million, dollar, that million uh, passenger forecast is reasonable, um, not overly conservative, nor overly bullish. Um, we, we, we know that there is significant capacity, capacity for as many as 1.5 million passengers. We do know that ships will, fit, will sail significantly um, under capacity, especially early in the season. So, so the budget assumes about a million passengers and then uh, really significantly inflation. And we've talked about inflation already at the finance committee. Um, inflation does have impact on both expenditure and revenue. Um, many of our revenues uh, inflate just as the, those tax, you know, the underlying thing that we're taxing inflates. Um, so inflation does have a significant positive impact on taxes at the same time that it causes us to spend um, significantly more on the expenditure side for basically everything we're doing. Um, I make a note here that inflation is not a monolith. And what I mean is that, you know, you know, sometimes we hear on the TV or whatever that inflation was 5.4% or whatever, and we think everything went up 5.4%, but that's not what happens at all. Fuel has gone up 30%. Housing has gone up 20% flat screen televisions have gone down 10%, right? I mean, so, so everything moves according to its own um, economic impulse. Um, when we talk about inflation and we talk about a number, we're talking about an average of all of those things. So a lot of the inputs to government will inflate much faster than 5% and others uh, will not. Um, but inflation will be a big piece, uh, has been a big piece of the budget as we know it. Let me walk through the budget summary, which is on page, um, in the back of your book, it's marked DOC1. It looks like this. And maybe I'll get it up on the screen also. Yeah, it's number DOC1, which is, comes after page 222. There's a series of attachments back there that are um, numbered that way. Okay. Um, so this format we've worked through a couple of times. We've tried to be, we've tried to start being consistent about showing you this format. Um, uh, over and over again, just so that it's easier to understand uh, what's what's going on, and and I think just this just in the interest of of centering us all, I'll I'll start by walking through FY22 current year, and then I'll walk forward to the 23 budget. Um, although I may skip a little bit of the fine detail in the current year, so just the way that this works, um, you see blue row, a blue row, a green row, and an orange row. That blue row is the manager's proposed budget. The the green row is the uh, assembly adopted budget, and then the orange row is the final year-end audited numbers. Or in for FY22, it'll be a projection. So. 
The manager's proposed budget at FY22 started at uh, 158.6 million in uh, revenue and 166 million in expenditure, which would have had us at a $7.8 million deficit. Obviously the assembly made a number of changes to that budget last year. You can see uh, all of those things that were variously uh, added to the budget um, in the assembly process, but also uh, you were able to include um, some additional Alaska uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds um, and the change in property valuation that had not been forecast uh, also helped you in that process. So what had been a seven point eight million dollar deficit in the manager's budget came down to a five point four million dollar deficit. Moving forward from the assembly adopted budget, you see uh, between the green row and the orange row, um, all of the supplemental appropriations that were made during the year, uh, as well as all the variances for revenue um, and expenditures that were uh, not supplementally appropriated, but were unanticipated. Uh, you can run down that long list there, Satter Harbor, deferred maintenance, uh, the Harris Harbor Boatyard, the gondola, Capital Civic Center, uh, EOC expenditures, et cetera. All of those things, um, you know, it, it seems unusual to have spent so much in supplemental appropriations, but I think um, the, the simple reason that happens is because we were quite conservative in the budget process. You didn't authorize as much as you might have, and, and we wound up having more in fund balance than you thought, and, and we have certain staff have certainly encouraged you over the year to, to move forward on some of your assembly goals uh, with supplemental appropriations, so you did that. Uh, you come down here, you also see in the uh, variances, you see a personal services lapse. Um, very, very significant this year, $4.2 million in lapse. That's money that uh, has been appropriated to the manager to spend on personnel for providing city services that won't be spent. A lot of reasons that happens. Um, it, it represents vacancies. It does represent um, the um, some programs being shuttered to some degree. There was really significant uh, personnel savings at the the aquatics programs, for example, this year, but also really significant vacancy and, and police, all that together. You also see a, a significant general fund lapse um, for non-personnel. Um, no, I'm sorry. That uh, There's a small lapse for non-personnel, and I'll talk about that in a second, but that larger lapse you see there, the 1.98, that was my encouragement to you to, uh, um, to not transfer general funds to the debt service fund to cover unreimbursed school bond debt that had been included in the budget. Um, I encouraged you not to do that. You have concurred with that. So we're, we've lapsed to that GF transfer, which effectively saves you about $2 million in the current year. And then a small non-purpose personal services lapse. And it's not, um, you know, as the departments work through their budgets, not surprisingly, they tend to underestimate the size of their non-personnel lapse, but I'm not surprised that it's small this year for the simple fact that everybody's costs are going up. Things that people thought would cost one thing are costing more. So it's not, um, it's, it's not an indication of anything other than I think people are trying to, departments are trying to hedge against uh, cost increases that, that they don't totally under, didn't totally understand as they worked through the budget. And then you see a really significant amount of revenue, um, to almost $12 million of ARPA funds that replace state marine passenger fees. That number is gonna change a little bit for a reason we can talk about later, but um, the ARPA uh, lost government local revenue grant thought it would be. So those two things together, you know, in excess of $20 million. Sales tax considerably above forecast. Um, and then the original ARP award was actually um, it, it was it was bigger than we thought it would be. So um, then there's two little things there. You know, the if you remember on the day that we passed the budget last year, uh, the assembly chose to reduce the mill rate. So the budget you passed had the mill rate in it that you changed that night. There was no way around that. So that's just a cleanup. And then um, MVRT taxes have continued to be squirrely. But in any event. Um, we, we, all of those changes taken together, really significant additional spending and really significant additional revenue moved us from a budget a deficit of 5.4 million in the current year to a budget surplus in the current year of 7 million. And it's, and, and it really just, that is all federal money, no matter how you, how you look at it. Um, it's federal money that's making that difference. Uh, in addition to, you know, a really sizable personal services lapse, but also, um, choosing to preserve, uh, that $2 million that you would have otherwise spent on unreimbursed school bond debt. 
Um, that gets us through FY22. Are there any questions up to that point? That's just current year. Ms. Hughes Candies. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this is a silly question. Um, and perhaps because you said that just gets us up to current year. I'm just confused by the labeling. It was helpful to hear you talk through them, but I'm looking at, for instance, the Harris Harbor boatyard and the gondola and wondering why these are here. Dot, dot, dot. And this could just be, I had a long day and I'm yeah. thinking about the fiscal year wrong. Yeah, thank you. Assembly member Hughes Gandy's uh, chair team. The, this is the, the, this is just a, it's really a running tally of how you have spent general funds. You know, it's, it's interesting because one of the things that we always try and the finance department for the last several years has been trying to display more clearly is how the assembly passes one kind of budget and we get to a totally different place by the end of the year. Right. This is, this is in an effort to do that. Right. And it's, and the reason we do it this way is it's never one thing or another. It's the, big combination of all of these things. So all of these things are things that you have done that spent general funds or that saved general funds or we got money that replaced general funds or whatever. So it's, it's really a running tally. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. It literally was a fiscal year thing. I was looking at FY23 oh, oh. for too long. No, this is great. I just I'm, had a little brain fart, yeah. Mr. Watt. And just briefly, I wanna say that um, pre-pandemic, Normal city practice would be uh, not a lot of supplemental appropriations during the year. Uh, so we've, we've definitely gotten out of that practice. And I think, um, I think that's a goal for us uh, to get back to a more disciplined budget process, a more disciplined um, process for the community to approach the city for funds. Um, it's from a budgetary standpoint, it's been a really wild time. Um, and, and this just kind of details the decisions we made through the year, and they were all uh, made for good reasons. But if you go back to, you know, 18, 17, 16, definitely not our prior business practice. Our prior business practice would have been, sounds like a great idea, get back to us in April, and we'll consider it in the context of all of our other budgetary issues. Yeah, you hear that, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Make note of that. Uh, Ms. Wall and then Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm curious about the personal ser services lapse. Um, you know, the reasons that you kind of listed seemed, you know, related to the labor shortage and the pandemic. What, what is our, is there a normal amount that we tend to lapse in a non crazy year? It's a, it's a good, that's a good question. Um, we have often used a million and a half or maybe 2 million as a planning number. Um, I think in every year that I've been the finance director, we've exceeded that number twofold. Um, it's the personnel service lapse happens for a lot of different reasons. Prior to the pandemic, it really happened because it, we struggled to hire police officers. I mean, that was just the biggest part of it. Um, the, during the pandemic, it happened for a lot of other reasons. You know, we had rec facilities that weren't open. We had people who couldn't work. We had positions that were unfilled. And now we, you know, we finally are kind of catching up a little bit with just a labor shortage where it's actually just hard to hire people. So, so we do have vac more vacancies for longer. Um, a $4.2 million personal services lapse is gigantic. I mean, it really is a, a significant magnitude. Uh, you know, the manager and I have talked at some length about there, there are things we can do to change the budget so we don't have a personal services lapse that big. I mean, so the way that the state budgets, for example, it applies a much larger vacancy factor. So the budget is smaller and then you don't have such a big lapse. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's kind of a shell game to do that because it doesn't really change your cost. I think, you know, take police. I think we generally would agree that if the police department could hire all of its officers, we would want them to do that, right? So um, it's not really that we don't want um, these organizations to have the budget authority to hire those positions. I think we want them to be able to hire them. It's just, 
it's challenging for different reasons at different times. Prior to the pandemic, it was largely uh, police. Uh, this year, it is a, it's a little bit of everything. Good. Uh, Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to comment on uh, Mr. Manager's comment about uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, uh, out of budget spending didn't happen. Um, it is my recollection, but I don't have the data in front of me that things did come to the assembly and at times we would deal with them as they came to the assembly. Um, I, I take slight umbrage at the characterization or at the possible characterization that the assembly is running after shiny new toys uh, when we've been in a very difficult situation and we've tried to make good decisions as they come up. And we also, this assembly has, for example, made the point to the glory hall, we need to get you into the funding cycle. So um, I, I think that I take offense, frankly, at, at, at the implication that the assembly is just throwing money around and running after shiny new toys. Thank you. Ms. Huskandis. Thank you, Madam Chair. One other question about the personnel laps. Would this capture, um, for instance, we had like librarian staffing the call line or where we move things uh, and we we're paying them from different funding pots. So how, when we were creating the budget, is that captured anywhere in here? If the funding source we actually paid people with wasn't the one we intended to originally? Um, Assembly member Hugh Scandies, it, it's a, that's a super complicated question to answer. For the most part, when we have general, when we have employees that work for general funded departments, even if they get paid for by a federal grant, for example, that federal grant still runs through the general fund and you won't see it as a personnel service lapse. Um, you are referring, I believe, back to activity that we had, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, not so much in the current year FY22, but in prior year FY21, where we had a lot of employees that we displaced from a library to an EOC emergency operation type activity. Um, there wasn't as much of that in FY22. There might be a tiny bit, but it wasn't the norm for the most part. Uh, staff in libraries, parks and rec, other forward-facing service areas had gone back to their typical assignments. Okay, uh, any more questions on FY22 before we move forward? I think it's, I think it's good rooting and it's obviously not the subject of tonight. Okay, um, FY23, so we tried this year a little bit to get a handle on an adjusted base budget, not for, for no other reason than we just wanted to try and make it a little easier to understand. The way that we build the budget for this document is that we take the prior year, remember that that excludes supplementals, right? So that's not the amended budget, that's the adopted budget. Um, so it excludes any supplementals, but mostly the supplementals you made were one-time money anyways, they weren't ongoing operations. Um, we remove from the prior year budget as much as we can, expenditures and revenues that were one time. And then we add to that sales tax growth and property growth, property tax growth. And that gives us a kind of a baseline for thinking about the budget. Um, that kind of a baseline for thinking about the budget says 165 and a half million in revenue and 163 and a half million in expenditures. Obviously, it's not that's not a perfect baseline. There's lots of things that are below this. You could argue to move up and call them part of the adjustment. I wouldn't get too lost in that, but um, obviously, it is useful to have a bit of a starting place and then just realize the things that uh, the manager has added to the budget through the budget development process for your consideration. So we'll just walk through all of those. Um, 43.7 in reduced federal support. That's just the truing up of federal grants that change over time. I wouldn't get too high centered there. Um, we, are, we do have in the budget now for real, hopefully for the first time, uh, reimbursement for ambulance transports, various called SEMT -E -E or used to be called GEMT. We've been working on this for a number of years. We had it in a budget two years ago. It didn't happen. We took it out of last year's budget and now we've gotten it back in because we really do believe we're gonna receive it uh, in FY23. 
Uh, $350,000 benefits the general fund because uh, in prior, uh, prior administrations made a decision to charge 85% of allocated costs out to the enterprise and to the non-general funds, and we changed that this year. And now all of the enterprises and the funds, except for Eagle Crest, are being charged 100% of their allocated costs rather than 85%. This is a strange thing that just carried forward for many years. Um, what it really was doing was it was just subsidizing enterprise and, and fund level activities by 15% of allocated costs. My advice to the assembly would be if you want to subsidize those activities, there's other better, clearer, more transparent ways to do that. Why not Eagle Crest? Uh, good question. Um, Chair Treem, we we've we spared Eagle Crest for for two reasons. One, Eagle Crest is not really like the other enterprise funds and and funds, right? They they are a quasi fund in all kinds of ways. Yes, they have their own management, they have their own empowered board, but they are essentially still heavily funded by the general fund. Um, if uh, it, I would hope in the future that what we see is an opportunity to move them from 85% to 100% at a time where their costs would have otherwise been going down. It's on Ms. Spiegel and I's list to move them over time to 100% rather than 85%. This wasn't the year because their allocated costs were already going up. Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's not an enormous amount of money, but uh, have you heard from those who are responsible for the budgets on the, the enterprise boards about the impacts that this will have on their budgets? Because it could be significant for some of them. And, and it's a, I mean, obviously, ultimately, it's the assembly's decision, but it's pretty arbitrary to do it now. Yeah, thank you, uh, Assembly Member Hale. Um, the, I think that there, there's certainly impact. I mean, ever, any time that we um, allocate costs to the enterprises, there's, there's impact. I think that for most of the enterprises this year, they're significantly more focused on the uh, increased cost of insurance. That, that is driving their interest and their attention more so than the change in allocated costs. Um, at the same time, I fully understand that enterprises hate paying allocated costs. I mean, every time we engage in that conversation internally, we try to rationally tell them that these are services they're receiving from the city that they would pay more for had they had to go out and, and seek them uh, privately. So uh, we have a lot of conversations with the enterprises about those allocated costs. We do think that they're in their best interests. You know, in a, in a few limited places, I, I have had the conversation of like, well, maybe it would make more sense for you to go out. Um, by way of by way of example, and, and I don't mean to make a mountain out of one anecdote, but the hospital was always frustrated about the amount of money that it paid and allocated costs to the law department. And that, I think that that cost was 80 to $100,000, just make something up. Um, last year, Mr. Palmer and the hospital made a decision for the hospital to seek private third-party counsel. Um, that third-party counsel cost them way more than they were paying the law department uh, for similar service. I, and I'm sure they're well served by a third party attorney, um, but it does stand as an example that for the most part, when an enterprise can use a centrally, serve, centrally provided service, they're probably gonna get a, a, a better deal than they could seek uh, independently. Mr. Watt and then Ms. Gladyshevsky. Uh Thank you, Chair. So, so a little bit on the historic practice. Um, the, Previously, I don't think we had a good handle on uh, the, those costs and how they should be allocated. And I think the prior finance director was repeating the prior finance director's approach of 85% because there was less certainty on it. One of the things that we've done uh, in recent years is we've done a cost allocation study. Um, independent accountant comes in, looks at the books and says, here's where how you should allocate your costs. Um, now that we have, like, I think a, a, a good method, an accurate method, um, I think it's appropriate to allocate those costs out unless the assembly wants to uh, provide some type of subsidy. Uh, so we went from an informal practice with um, lower precision information, uh, and now we have pretty good precise information. So that's a little bit explains the changes in practice. Ms. Gladyshevsky. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I wholeheartedly support accurate 100% eventually. Uh, but I just to the Eagle Crest, I don't want to die, but there was something a few years ago happened with Eagle Crest and cost allocations and super surprise to them and something. So there's a, a reason more than we're being nice to Eagle Crest to keep them at 85. Do you remember that, Mr. Watt? Wasn't there some, doesn't matter, but it wasn't just you're trying to be nice to Eagle Crest. Yeah, something happened specifically with the Eagle Crest for some reason, I don't can't remember. But anyway, that's all. Okay, thank you. So moving on, um, three hundred thousand dollars increased charges for service. That's mostly uh, across the board, sort of continued normalization coming out of the pandemic. A lot of that is parks and rec for for rec type fees and activities. But it's you know we we take in fees across CBJ and just as people are out in the community more using city services more. Those amounts are um, budgeted to be higher in 23 uh, than in 22. And for whatever it's worth, um, I don't know that I could tell you with perfect accuracy, um, but there's that's not where they'll eventually get. So in FY24, we think there will be yet more uh, of that. And then on the expenditure side, um, you see a long list of things that uh, have, have evolved through the manager's development of the budget with the departments. Um, a million and a half dollars additionally to uh, sales tax to support CIPs. That is both um, uh, the, the, the portion of the, the CIP for streets specifically, and also another a small portion is included in, in, uh, for the general sales tax. That's the non-street section of the CIP. And we can talk about that a little bit uh, next week when we talk about the CIP at length. Um, additional general fund, support, general fund support to JSD. This is uh, mentioned in the manager's message. I think that we should ask the school district to talk about this um, and, and talk you through it. Uh, what's happened is that um, if, if, if you just might indulge a little anecdote or thought experiment, just, just imagine two communities, um, one community with uh, lots of students, but a relatively small tax base, you know, what we might think of as a poor or less wealthy community and another community with very few students, um, but a very large tax base, what we might think of as a wealthy community. Um, and there's a spectrum of the communities in between. Obviously, the communities with lower tax bases and lots of students just need more state support and off in, in order for those students to have the same educational opportunity that uh, a wealthier community with fewer students has. So there's the formula, the, the, de the, the deed formula shifts as you move toward a community with a larger tax base and fewer students. And we've shifted that direction far enough that we are now subject to the formula in a different way where what's driving our minimum contribution is our very high property value and relatively low student count. So what's happened is that the state by formula is shifting cost from the state to CBJ for the provision of education. So what happened is that our minimum required contribution went up by, by 1.26 million because we've shifted. Um, we're just inching closer and closer to being a community with a smaller number of students and a very large tax base. So the formula knows that we just need less state support. That's really what's happened. I think that I may have butchered that a little bit. I think ask the school district to talk about that. Um, but the, the, the stinger there is that it's not more money for education. Um, it doesn't change the cap. It doesn't change anything. It is a cost shift from the state to the municipality under the statutory formula for education. So um, we will not be able to avoid it. Um, obviously, the only way the assembly could choose to avoid that increase is to, is to not fund to the cap. I mean, you are obviously not required to fund to the cap. Um, so you could avoid that cost increase, but the manager has built that increase into the budget, uh, presuming that you would fund to the cap as you have for many, many, many years. Um, almost $800,000 uh, marked as increase to service contracts. That's everything under the sun that you can possibly imagine. All the things that we buy and pay for um, that are not necessarily... Um, any one thing or another. I mean, it's, uh, but this is, that's just service contracts. Obviously we pay for all kinds of services. Those services are getting more expensive uh, because all their inputs are higher, both their commodity costs and their labor is, is getting more expensive. Plus they have their own 
uh, desire to keep being profitable. So increase to service contracts, almost $800,000. Um, merit increases and in other personnel actions. That's all the, the, you know, we obviously CBJ has salary schedules and, and, and for those of you ex experience the state, most employees get an increase most years in the first six years of their employment and every other year after that. Um, those cost money every year. To some degree, those cost increases are offset by retirements and, and other things, but um, we do see some cost increase every year for that. Um, Two, uh, two, two, almost three po new positions in streets. I, I think I won't go into that super great length now. I think there will be another opportunity to talk about that increase in streets. Uh, you all heard this winter um, public outcry about snow removal. Uh, and we also hear a little bit of that same thing, maybe at a lower volume in the summer about our ability to maintain sidewalks and gutters and ditches and all those other things that street crews do in the summer. So there's a proposal there to, to add several positions to streets. Increased fleet replacement contributions. This is probably something that we should expect to be a regular feature. Um, fleet fleet, re fleet uh, replacement contributions is the amount that we spend out of the operating budget into an account where um, every department is saving money to buy stuff they need. So it's the place that the police department's buying their police cars from, and it's the place that the fire department is buying an ambulance from, and uh, for the most part. So, so we try to manage those costs uh, by spending money incrementally out of the operating budget rather than always coming to the assembly with another big ask. Um, I will make one little note because it aligns with something else you're working on. There was a request this year to the manager to buy a ladder truck. Um, and, and there's reasons it was further out on the fleet schedule. It got moved up. There was really no particularly realistic way to do that inside the manager's operating budget. And eventually we've made a decision to propose to the assembly to do it outside the operating budget as a supplemental appropriation. So um, on the manager's table that looked like this from a couple Saturdays ago, you'll see um, money for a ladder truck in the 1% sales tax, which is the proposal. Otherwise that would have been in the fleet fleet also. Household hazardous waste, junk vehicle service contract increase. I mean, we, you know, we call out, we only call these out because there's some of them that are big. Um, we've done that so that there's a big increase there. Uh, to, uh, about a quarter million dollars to move to Microsoft 0365 and to two-factor authentication. Um, the, the day, CBJ, this is a really big increase. I, uh, several people have pointed it out to me. It is a big increase. Um, CBJ has done an exceptionally good job over several decades um, managing its office suite over a really long period of time. The office suite that I use today on my computer is a decade old. Um, we've saved over time a lot of money doing that. The chat, the change is that, um, you know, desktop office software is moving to a subscription model. Um, the, the world in which we go to the store and buy an off the shelf product and install it on our computer and it works forever. Those days are largely behind us, both at home uh, and in enterprises. Uh, we have had to, we, we are having to move toward a subscription model for Microsoft Office. The advantage is that we will now have a modern, up-to-date Microsoft Office platform all the time. Um, the disadvantage is that it's going to cost us more uh, on an annual basis. So you're seeing that for the first time. A quarter million dollars there for the comprehensive plan that comes right out of the assembly uh, goals. So that's in the budget for a comprehensive plan, uh, update the comprehensive plan. Increased its supplies. It's a smaller number than service contract, but it's, uh, it, it's a lot of its chemicals. It's salt, it's chemicals in the aquatics programs. Um, that's what's driving the biggest part of those increases. Uh, those chemicals that are, are used um, are costly. Uh, increased social service assembly grant. We did work with, um, we worked with JCF this year to do two things to the social services, actually three things to the social service assembly grant. Um, one was to stick another $150,000 for the glory hall into that uh, grant that's in the manager's pull. We do have a request from JCF to do that. The JCF's request included yet more money than that. We did grant, uh, we did include in the manager's proposed budget a 10% increase to JCF's uh, overall grant for social services. And I think when they're here and they present to us, we should talk about that then. Um, there is additional request that remains on the decision list. Increased insurance premiums. This is the general fund portion of insurance in uh, premium increases. Um, 
the general fund doesn't own quite as much property as the school district and our enterprises do. So this uh, amount is uh, not very significant, not nearly as significant as it is for the school district, for example, uh, but it is um, almost a quarter million dollars. Uh, an increase to fleet maintenance rates. That's uh, something we fleet maintenance, fleet maintenance has, is a fund that has been running into the negative. Uh, we've made an adjustment to rates uh, that affects both the enterprises and the general fund, and this is the general fund impact of that. Ms. Hale. Uh, thank you. Uh, just for the record and maybe for the public, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe the school district owns their buildings. I believe uh, CBJ owns the buildings and the school district uses them and pays the insurance premium, and I just want to make sure that's correct. Thanks. Assemblymember Hale, um, it's, 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 it's correct and, 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 and with a with an, with an important addition, I'll say. We do own the school district's uh, buildings. Um, however, insurance of those buildings under state law is considered to be an educational expense. So the cost of insurance for school buildings is an expense that must be included under the cap. So the thing that you'll hear from the school district is that because their insurance costs went up, they have to spend some other less money on instruction and we don't have any way to mitigate that unfortunately follow up thank you madam chair um i have heard that stated differently that that it's actually not required by state law the coverage of insurance by um uh by the school district and i'm just wondering and, and maybe i just need to ask somebody with the school district but i'm just wondering if someone can follow up and maybe give me a statutory reference or something like that I do, I do think Mr. Palmer is on the line and has been uh, addressing this question internally. If Great. You want to do that. Thanks. Oh, don't have to do it now. I, I just, I, I think just he at might some point. have a quick answer if he Thanks. comes over. If okay. he comes over, we'll get him. Thanks. Just kind of listening. <laughs> okay, it, it, Mr. P Mr. Palmer may not be available, and, that, and that's fine. Oh, he, he popped up. I'm picturing like a whole image. <laughs> so, Miss, Mr. Palmer did unmute. I think he's just been listening. Um, Mr. Palmer, the question was about um, the legal requirement for the cost of insurance of school buildings to be paid for by the school district as part of their educational expense, which would be subject to the cap. Can you speak to that? Uh, briefly, so my understanding is the same that you just described. I lost a little bit in the move over. Um, and Ms. Hale, and for the assembly, I will work on getting you the statutory reference tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Okay, good. Uh, we were on the increased insurance premiums, uh, fleet maintenance rates. Um, the assembly talked at its uh, retreat about uh, additional support in the clerk's office. Uh, the manager worked with the clerk and found a way to do that. So that's a position and a half. Um, it supports the clerk's office generally, but including both public meetings and the elections process. And then travel and training increases, uh, not, not a huge amount. We called it out because it, um, it's noticeable. It's a return to a pre-pandemic travel environment where employees will travel for training and conferences and professional development, et cetera. Uh, and then I've left a blank at the bottom of this uh, somewhat intentionally uh, just to note that um, what's not in the budget yet uh, is the negotiated uh, wage and benefit increase that uh, the assembly is, is talking about now in executive session that the uh, Human Resources Department is working with the bargaining or organizations on. So uh, that is a, a big placeholder. Uh, we do know that there will certainly be increased costs there. Okay, so the manager's budget, uh, all totaled, uh, both uh, the, the decisions that are the, the things that go into the adjusted base and all the decisions made in the budget, uh, then move us to 166 and a half million of revenue and 170 million of expenditure for a $3.4 million deficit or use of fund balance um, 
in the way that the budget has been proposed. And then if we're tracking fund balance along the side here, you'll see that the projected year end on that, you can't quite see it there, but well, maybe if I move it down, you can. Um, the projected year end fund balance in FY22 would be 35 and a half million. That's at the bottom of the first page. Uh, we use 3.4 million of that uh, as part of the manager's proposed budget, reducing the fund balance by the end of FY23 uh, to just over $32 million. I'll pause for a breath. Any questions? Ms. Hale. Sorry to be asking all the questions. Um, I, I haven't read the, the whole budget book yet, <laughs> uh, but we have FY21, 22, and 23 on these two pages that we're looking at. Um, do you have a similar manager's proposed budget, assembly adopted budget, and final year end with the, the, the deficits and the surpluses? Do you have that information available for prior years? Because pre-pandemic, you know, it's alarming that we have this deficit, but pre-temp pandemic, it is my recollection that um, we consistently were under re underestimating revenues. And so we consistently year after year were very worried about our budget and then ended up with a surplus at, after the end of the year. Um, so if there's a way to get that information, that would be handy. If somebody remember Hale, th that, that is something that we're working to create in this format. And so it, we, we will endeavor to, to do that and work back one year at a time. It's, it's an exercise of research, but it, it's, it is worth doing. It's valuable to me to see it in this format too. Thank you, uh, I appreciate that. And I only say that because I think it's, we're in a kind of a squirrely time here. We're coming out of this two year period of time where who knows what's gonna happen. But I think it's important, I think, uh, our, our finance director does what he's supposed to do and is conservative in his revenue estimates. And so that results sometimes, well, every time I've been involved in the budget that we end up having more revenue. So I just think it's important for us to remember that it's only a projection and that's all we can do at this point in time. So as we go through the process. Mr. Watt. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, um, and this is a little bit following up on Assembly Member Hale's comments. Um, this is a really unusual budget, and if you if you read the uh, the manager's message, I think on on page nineteen, it really tries to articulate um, all of the. You know, we've got really highly volatile numbers. Um, it's it's been very difficult to uh, project revenues and expenditures, and it's felt like everything has been a moving target. Um, and, and it has been a moving target. Uh, so, so if I was going to summarize the approach um, to the manager's uh, budget, I think it's really don't overreact. Um, it's hard to pin down everything that's happening now. Uh, it, it is appropriate this year. Um, to use more fund balance than we traditionally have. We do have a really big lapse, um, but I think we also, we also need to be prepared for coming years, but we really can't hang our hat on what those coming years look like. Um, I would love to tell you that I felt confident in what FY24 might look like. I'm not at all confident and, and I don't think anybody can be. Um, certainly inflation is a huge factor. Um, as we've talked about, it's been hard to hire people. In some instances, it's been hard to spend money. You know, the, the supply chain problems and uh, just absurdly high prices for some commodities has damped down our spending. Um, you know, we've had, every time we turn around, uh, we have a new piece of information, home value skyrocketing, uh, tourism numbers uh, un uncertain. Um, so I, th I think in, in this year, um, I, it is a really unusual budget. It is really, really unusual. And, and for me, I think the, um, the best thing uh, that I can think to articulate is um, let's acknowledge that uncertainty. Let's not overreact. Um, I think the public uh, appreciates uh, that kind of stable, deliberative, uh, governmental approach. They like our services. 
Um, but we also, you know, we really, you know, going to have one eye to FY24, because uh, I am concerned that as we get more certainty, uh, we might be entering a period where, you know, we structurally have more um, costs and revenues, but I'm not at all confident saying that today. Um, but, it, you know, we have what we have in front of us. Uh, we do need to pass a budget by the middle of June. Uh, this, the manager's budget, we've all worked together to make the best recommendations that we can. Um, and it, it's, it's unusual. It's really unusual to have really large fund balance, contemplate a bunch of one-time uh, expenditures, uh, uh, projecting expenses um, fairly significantly ahead of revenues um, and, uh, you know, a record large lapse in the midst of all that. It's, it's, it's no exaggeration, a strange time to be uh, doing a municipal budget. That is the perfect segue to a question I was trying to figure out when to ask. Um, and I think I have a different view than Ms. Hale. Um, in the four years, well, three, three budgets we've been through. Is that how many budgets we've gone through? I can't remember. We have yet to pass one that is balanced and that concerns me. And in this penultimate paragraph of the manager's introductory memo, it does talk about, do we have a structural deficit? And my question is uh, right in here, but it may be too early for the assembly to act with confidence on corrective actions. And I think you just expanded on that a little bit, but if you, my question was like, what, what do you mean by that? Ms. Dream, as I was chewing on my orange, I did not hear the last part of your sentence. <laughs> well, you kind, of, you kind of were just answering this, but if you could just expand a little bit on the, the confidence and corrective actions and maybe when, when would we know if we were truly facing a structural deficit problem? All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, when will we know, I think is a great question. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I think when we start seeing um, less uh, volatility in our economic indicators, when we get to a point where, uh, as an example, uh, maybe economists agree on future rates of inflation, um, or we get to a point where uh, people in tourism um, uh, agree on what next year's tourism visitation might look like. Um, when we get to a point where, you know, houses um, don't sell for 10% over the asking price in a day or two, um, and we're just not there. Uh, I just, uh, you know, when we get to when we get to a point where we feel like um, lending rates have stabilized, um, it's I, I feel uncomfortable. Uh, acting like I have um, much confidence in being able to predict uh, where we're going to be in six to 12 months. I feel very uncomfortable in that. Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the follow-up. Um, I, I know we may disagree about the budget, but I just wanted to clarify that we're talking about two, two different things. I'm not talking about a balanced budget that we pass. I'm talking about the actual actuals at the end of the year and how they compare to the uh, the uh, projections and the budget. So the, that, that's what I'm referring to, that our actual revenues have been in higher every year, um, even pre-pandemic. Okay. If there aren't more questions, I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna roll forward to a graph uh, real quick that you've seen before. I think it's just good to look at it again, and then I'm gonna turn to revenue uh, directly. So this is the Green Mountain graph that you have seen before. We just try and keep this updated. It's getting to be a nice picture of where we've come in terms of fund balance. Uh, the picture is relatively obvious. <laughs> big mountain going up and getting bigger is a, a, a good or bad thing, depending on your view. Uh, obviously, it means that the assembly has significant unrestricted fund balance that it can spend. Uh, as you know, on Monday night, 
um, almost $20 million of supplemental appropriations were introduced um, that would spend down a really significant portion of that unrestricted fund balance. Um, we, I think uh, the manager and myself continue to think that that is generally a good idea. It's generally the right path forward to do that. It's in line with your assembly goals. Uh, certainly at some point there is a question about unrestricted fund balance just being unnecessarily big. Um, and I think that uh, we are certainly in that range now and we could probably argue around the margins about what the lower threshold is. But I think everybody can generally agree that the amount of money we have in unrestricted fund balance now is not a necessary cushion. Um, so um, one other note I probably should have made as I walked through this, that almost $20 million of supplemental appropriations that were introduced on, uh, introduced on Monday night, they are not reflected in the budget at all. Um, we did not include them in any dimension. Any questions about this? Obviously, just to explain this again, the restricted general fund reserve is the peachy pink uh, portion of the graph at the bottom. The green portion that sits on top of that, these are stacked is the unrestricted fund balance. Together, they total the amount uh, just, you know, by the end of FY22, just over $50 million. Uh, and then the, the bars, the little column, not the bars, the columns you see at the bottom represent um, the usage of unrestricted fund balance in those years, um, meaning basically a deficit that causes to use fund balance. Ms. Hill. I'm, I'm sorry, meaning, what did you say about what those, because in my mind, those green bars represent uh, surplus. They, yes. Rather around. than. That's correct. Okay. Green, thank you. green bars up, a green column up means surplus that added to fund balance. Red column down means deficit that used fund balance. Thank you. And just uh, kind of a procedural logistical question. If the if whatever number of those introduced ordinances get passed, or those those are FY twenty two, they we're not talking about those for FY twenty three, or where would they show up? Yeah, chair team, that's a good question. That was on my mind yesterday, actually. Um, it, it's it's uh, for us, it's uh, a question of math and timing. Um, obviously, if if it, they they've been introduced, they'll be up for public hearing on April twenty fifth. If you pass them that night, they will be FY twenty two appropriations. It is not, it is also not impossible for you to say, well, we don't want to do any of that. Let's just roll them into the CIP. They would become FY23 appropriations. It doesn't, it, there's lots of ways to get to that end goal. I think the point that started with the Saturday meeting was to talk about how to advance big projects in, you know, in concert with the assembly goals, whether you do that as part and parcel of the FY23 budget, or you do it on the 25th on, in FY22, it doesn't. It, it doesn't change the outcome. Okay, are we good on this graph? Okay, um, I'm gonna move forward and talk about revenue. And I, I think it's, uh, I appreciate Assembly Member Hale's uh, perfect segue to that question. Um, I too, and, I, and I've said this to the committee before, um, in the first several years that I was the finance director, I, I tried to think deeply about how my predecessors um, projected revenue. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's hard to project revenue, but at the same time, as you track it through the year, you're like, well, of course, that's what happened. And you, and you learn a little bit about wh why it seems to do what it's doing. Um, I looked back a lot about why my predecessor had thought that revenues would be diminished in the pre-pandemic period before I started here and why that didn't happen, right? And I think that uh, Mr. Bartholomew, every year, very rationally saw things in our economy that gave him pause, that made him caution. He was watching, um, so for example, you know, roll back five or six years ago when the bottom fell out of the price of oil, there was real concern that we would see potentially just collapse of state government here. That didn't quite happen. It certainly never impacted the economy in the way that it could have. It didn't impact home prices in the way that it could have. We did lose state jobs. We continue to lose state jobs, but other parts of the economy have been strong. Um, I've developed a theory that one of the things that's happened is that we've gained retirees faster than we've lost working state employees. That only lasts so long, but it's one reason I think the economy has been a little more stable, even though we've lost a lot of state jobs. 
But my point is that Mr. Bartholomew, I don't think he was just trying to be overly conservative. I think he was looking at the landscape and he was legitimately seeing things he thought uh, were threats. And then year after year, those threats just didn't materialize and we saw more and more and more revenue. Um, at the same time, it has been my effort um, not to be conservative or not to be overly conservative. Um, and I'm not sure all of you are comfortable with that. Um, I think that I've tried to give you revenue forecasts that are just as likely to be too high as to be too low, um, meaning that I've tried to find a median point. Um, it doesn't mean they're right. Uh, they're guesses, uh, it, hopefully informed guesses. Um, and and that's that's where we're at. So so obviously sales tax is just sales tax just dominates all of our other revenues in terms of what we forecast. So the the just to, to walk through this chart, we've seen it before, starting with FY22, we um, the adopted budget working by quarter included 11 million, 10.2 million, 9 million, 13 million, and then 1.8 in remote sales tax for a total of 45 million. That's that row. The actual FY22 for quarter one was 13 million, 2 million over forecast. The uh, quarter two, October to December, was 9.8, about a half a million dollars under forecast. January through March is still a forecast, right? Because we don't, yes, yeah, still a forecast, not an actual, uh, but we do expect it to be higher based on the performance October to December uh, and on relatively normal happenings in that quarter in the world rel relative to all other things, plus inflation, you know, that's, we'll have that number at some point during the budget process. We'll be able to update this for real, but I, I still feel pretty confident about that. And then an increased forecast for the April to June quarter, again, reflective of inflation and reflective of what we think will be a reasonably good start to the, to the cruise season. Um, and then remote sales tax continues to outperform really significantly. So I had forecast 1.8 in the current year. Um, I now very confidently forecast 2.6 million uh, and we'll look at remote sales tax separately here. So now instead of 45 million, we are now forecasting uh, 48.6 48 million of uh, total sales tax. So uh, $3.6 million over budget, um, over, over forecast in FY22. Ms. Hughes-Scandies. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Rogers, I got a little, a little misstep. Could you speak to how quarter three influenced your decision on quarter four? Or maybe I misunderstood what you said about that. Yeah, Assemblymember Hughes-Scandies, quarter three is still a projection, right. as is quarter four. Um, I do think that we are slightly more bullish on those quarters in terms of dollars than we were because of inflation. Okay, so continuing on down, you'll see the FY23 forecast and the FY24 forecast. FY23 forecast starts with a $17.9 million quarter in quarter one. That's a big number. I mean, if you, if you just look at quarter one, just at that column, the peak of that quarter was 17.1 in FY20, 16.8 the year before that. Um, those years had higher cruise visitation for sure, but we've had at least eight to 9% of real inflation in that time. And that's one of the things I've really tried to focus on here is just the impact when you're looking back at those prior points of inflation. Inflation has a direct impact on sales tax. And we've talked before about the possibility that inflated costs would mean people buy less, but that's it, at this particular moment in history, that's not what economists are telling us that's gonna happen. Economists are saying people have money in their bank accounts, they're eager to spend. Um, so we, we continue to feel fairly confident uh, about that big number. October to December, uh, and, and for whatever it's worth, a little tiny bit of that 17.9 number will actually be the increase to, uh, and I've not really tried to account for this, but it will be in there, is uh, sales tax on board cruise ships. So you repealed that exemption. Uh, we will see a lot of that revenue, maybe as much as a half a million in that quarter. 
uh, October to December, uh, the 11.2 is where we were in FY20. Um, that's a number we could beat probably. Um, that, that may not be quite high enough, but obviously FY22's number was 9.8. So I've, I've, I've held back a little there. Um, the January to March quarter is the legislative quarter. It's the most um, un, it's the, it's the, it's the most unaffected by other economic things going on. The legislature is here. People are coming to visit the legislature. It's a very stable quarter. It's also the smallest quarter of the year. Um, 9.4 million is the projection there. And then 14.3 million in April to June, which again, uh, bigger than the last large quarter in April to June, um, but not by so much. So again, reflective of passenger counts being probably what they were in maybe FY18 or something, but considerable inflation since then. Uh, remote sales tax, 2.9 million. I think there's a very good chance next year that we get all the way to 3 million on remote sales tax. We're seeing really big returns. There's a separate sheet here we'll go through on remote sales tax. So the sales tax forecast for FY23, uh, $55.7 million um, is the biggest sales tax quarter we've ever had by quite a wide margin, but uh, almost 3 million of that is remote sales tax all on its own. Questions about the sales tax forecast? You can look at the graph if you want to. It, it just gives you a sense of which quarters are big and which quarters are not. And you can also see very clearly the pandemic quarters. Um... Hello, good up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rogers, on the, um, the remote sales tax, is this taken into consideration of what it looks like coming out of COVID where people can travel down to Seattle to buy stuff instead of having to order everything on Amazon? Yeah, thank you, Wilhel Gadok. That's a, a totally appropriate question. And the answer for the most part is no. Um, but I think it's a fair question. And, and certainly um, if we roll into next year and the remote sales tax returns are not what we expect, um, we, will, we will course correct. One thing that's always happening in the background at this phase of our, of our adoption of remote sales tax is that the remote sales tax commission is registering new sellers every day. So, you know, we've mostly gotten to all the big sellers, although there's one big fish left. Google has not registered yet with the commission and Google will be hundreds of thousands of dollars to CBJ every year. So there's one big fish left, but the commission continues to register smaller and smaller sellers. I just got a note today that said they'd registered Leatherman Incorporated, the little multi-tool thing. So if you buy directly now from Leatherman, you're going to, they're going to collect CBJ sales tax and remit it to us. So um, every day we're registering new sellers. So there's a, a counter trend, right? Which is every day there's more sellers in the system, but I think you're probably right. People, and I think it won't just be going to Seattle. Just think back to a Christmas time somebody might have ordered a toy that they might have picked up in town had it but for the pandemic. So we will see some shift back to Main Street shopping. Um, hard to know the magnitude. And I have not really tried to factor for that. Mr. Bryson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my questions are along those lines. Um, do you know what the business uh, sales tax return numbers are? Do we have more businesses in Juno? remitting sales tax or do we have less businesses in Juno uh, remitting sales tax since we're comparing everything to 2019? Do we know the number of businesses in town? Uh, Mr. Bryson, I do not know the answer to that question, but I will, um, I'll get it. I would think a, a small percent increase of new businesses coming to town would increase sales tax. And if we have a decrease in the percentage of businesses, would correlating decrease. The other uh, question I have is now that uh, some supply chain issues are starting to be relieved. Um, could that maybe offset what you're talking about before there were whole businesses in Juno that just couldn't get the products. And now that's less of a, a common story. Uh, supply chain problems are easing up. So do you have a suspicion on what that could do to sales tax if you look in your crystal ball for that one? But I, that factor is slowly becoming less of a factor 
Um, yeah, Assemblymember Brisson, I think you're totally right. Uh, it's been difficult to buy durable goods, it's, uh, appliances, vehicles, equipment, that kind of stuff. Um, and that those those challenges are easing up. We will see some sales tax come from that. I'll just make one tiny anecdote. Um, our projection of motor vehicle registration tax is all messed up because you couldn't really buy a new car this year. It was really hard. And um, we've been trying to figure out why our forecast for motor vehicle registration tax was just so wrong. And, and that's the, what we point to, we think, is that it was just very difficult to buy a new car. And to your point, we did not reduce the motor vehicle registration tax revenue in the coming year because we think that once you can buy a car, we will see those taxes bloom again. Um, but yes, it's on our mind, just the difficulty of buying durable goods. Okay. Oh. Ms. Gladyshevsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one thing about the revenue projections or how conservative or unconservative they are. Um, every year, the, you know, the manager and the finance director bring this information and nine eyes look on it and you're all the eyes that looked on it before we even saw it. And they they seem this yours seems reasonable just as the last ten have seemed reasonable given all the uncertainties you're multiplying uncertainty times uncertainty and yours is in the range as the rest of them have been I just comment yeah thank you yeah, th thank you so much Mr. Chair I I mean I appreciate that I, I think that's right I mean I, I am you know I spend a lot of time thinking about this but I'm guessing just like anybody else would um, I will say this. I think that there is substantially less likelihood this year that I am way under, right? I mean, if, if we got to the end of next year and we had 60 million in sales tax, I would be truly shocked um, because we've really tried to think hard about what inflation will do, what growth will do, what's really gonna happen. I mean, we've tried to get to that number and I would be surprised if I'm way too low. I also hope that I'm not way too high. I mean, I really think we should be within a, a reasonable window, a, a million or two either way. Um, that's the effort. Okay, uh, moving on. So the next page is specifically about remote sales tax. You can see along, perhaps more interesting to the committee is actually just gonna be to look along the, the right-hand side of this page and see what our remote sales tax returns have been over time. That number for January 216.9 is an actual. Um, and then I've just forecast February, March, April, May, June um, by month, because we see these revenues by month. And, and I, I've spent a lot of my attention on this because we see the numbers monthly and it's interesting. I do think we'll hit those numbers. I do know that today, we haven't seen our returns for February yet. I do know they were down at the commission, which follows the same pattern for last year. People don't spend a lot of money in February. I don't know why. Um, but so we reflected a minor reduction here. It could be bigger than that. Um, we'll see um, what happens there. Um, but all in all, we do get to a $2.6 million projection for FY22 current year and a $2.9 million forecast for next year. I think those will be right in the ballpark. We could hit $3 million next year. I think that's not, not out of the realm of possibility. And that the, this rolls up onto the page you saw before. I do have a question on this. Um, February is the worst month for a lot of reasons, and I'm glad to see that confirmed. But my um, remote sales tax question is about the number of sellers. Since we have started receiving remote sales tax, we've, you know, we've heard the, the number will go up because the number of sellers registered is going to go up, but I assume we're going to see a, like some diminishing marginal returns. And I would expect that today's sellers who are registering are relatively small. Do you know, is that growth in the number of sellers? What's the trend like in that growth? Is it, is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it staying the same? And do you know anything about the size of those sellers that are being registered you know, today? Yeah, the, the totally good question. And I got some information about this just today. So it's fresh on my mind. Um, the, I think the number that came out of the document that, that was shared with us today is that the commission registered a thousand sellers in the first 18 months that the commission existed. A thousand sellers in the first 18 months. That's how long it took to get to a thousand. We got to 2000 this month, 12 months after that. So 
you would think that the rate at which we're registering sellers would decline. Of course, that just makes sense. But for some reason, at least at this phase, we've registered a lot of sellers. What happens in practice is not that a small company that sells something directly comes to the commission and registers itself. That almost never happens. What happens is that a small company signs a contract with a third party that does remote sales tax in all 50 states. And so what happens is that we, uh, the commission eventually signs and navigates its relationship with that third party, and we get all of that third party's participants, right? So we tend to get waves of small businesses. Those businesses are probably not selling very much into the state. They meet the thresholds or they probably wouldn't register, um, but they're small. There is, interestingly, this problem of Google, this one massive whale still out there, which will be one of our largest returns once they register. So a little uneven. For the most part, lots and lots of small businesses. Eventually, it will plateau and we won't be registering so many. But in the phase we've been in, we've continued to register a lot of new businesses. Ms. Gladyshevsky. Quick question about requirements for if Google is a big fish that hasn't registered, is there some, how come? Or is there what happens yeah. when they don't? Yeah. I, I uh, thank you, uh, Assemblymember Glashevsky. I asked both of those questions today, uh, and the answer that I got back was um, it's impossible to get a real live human being at Google to, to talk to about anything. Um, so that has been, that has been <laughs> a challenge for the commission. Um, but they have continued to try to work through any number of parties to find the right person, email address, Jeez. cyborg, whatever that we would talk to at Google. Um, and then um, what the commission is going to do is the exact same thing that we would do. We will eventually force register them and we will start estimating the tax that they owe us. And after some period of force registering and estimating their tax, we will eventually sue them for that tax. And what they will do is they'll come back and say, well, actually, here's our sales. So then they'll register, but that's what it will take. Okay, that's remote sales tax. Um, hotel bed tax, very interesting. Um, the, the headline of the hotel bed tax projection, and I admit that I didn't show you this in December. I don't know if you remember this, but I didn't show you this because um, we were still like reeling from this really outstanding first quarter. So a million dollars of hotel bed tax was received in July to September last year, a million dollars um, in one quarter when the projection for the entire year was only a million and a quarter. So obviously uh, I forecast way too low. Um, I wound up talking a lot with Ms. Perry at Travel Juno about why that happened. I actually got uh, a separate report that comes from the hotel industry. And I was able to walk back from what they were describing as occupancy rates and average daily costs and all of that. And it's sort of like, yeah, I guess that does look like a million dollars. A couple things have changed here. One, the rate went up. So you're talking about a, a 9% rate rather than a 7% rate that does make a difference over prior quarters. Um, and the, we just had a lot of independent travel last year. Um, I think, you know, we were sort of hearing it, seeing a little bit. We just had a lot of independent travelers last quarter. Hard to imagine we have that kind of activity again, but I don't really know. Um, so the forecast in FY22 for that quarter was uh, 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 0.35. We actually had a, full, a round million. So we were way over forecast there. Uh, FY22 uh, adopted for the second quarter, uh, 0.21 and then 0.21 and then 0.48 for those three quarters. Uh, the actual for quarter two was 0.35. So we were over forecast. That's the, this, the Christmas quarter, the holiday quarter. Um, still a projection for January through March and April through June, slightly higher than our forecast because we were so far under. But really we're gonna have a big out, out, out performance in hotel tax. Uh, in FY22. So uh, the FY22 adopted was one, one and a quarter. It will be just over two, we think. So the FY23 forecast um, is, I think, emboldened in part because of that huge quarter uh, in July, but not overly so. 0.86 is the forecast. Um, first quarter, then point, uh, 0.26, that's 260,000, um, uh, 310,000, and then 660,000 walking through this quarters for a total of almost 2.1 million 
um, hotel bed tax in FY23, which would be just over what we're forecasting now for the current year. Um, again, this is in the range of something that's pretty hard to forecast. Um, but with the change in the rate, and again here, inflation, um, these I, I have confidence in these numbers. These, no, these numbers could be too low. And we will, um, there's a day on the calendar where we'll talk with Travel Juno. We can talk a little more about um, hotel bed tax generally. Okay. Um, liquor tax, uh, maybe I won't walk through this in so much detail. The FY22 adopted was uh, $890,000. We think we'll get pretty close to a million. Forecast next year to be just over a million. This number tends to be really durable over time. We will see the impact of inflation. We're all paying more for a pint of beer at the pub than we used to. So um, these numbers could be a little, uh, a little under and, and it would be inflation that, that drives them up. Marijuana, um, marijuana, again, a little hard to predict. We, we don't, can, it, it's, it's hard to know whether the consumption of marijuana continues to grow in the community or not. I, I don't have a crystal ball about that. Um, and it's also difficult to know what will happen with costs because marijuana is in the cycle of its coming into being here where marijuana is not necessarily getting more expensive. In many places, it's actually getting less expensive. Um, so we, We've, we've hedged our bets carefully with marijuana and not over projected this because I think there's a good possibility we're just going to see marijuana get less expensive, um, unlike a pint of beer, which will get more expensive. So it's, it just moves to the beat of its own drawing. Notice no, no diminishment during the pandemic, for, not that I <laughs> needed to point that out for anybody. But. Uh, tobacco tax, same thing. Difficult to forecast. We keep a flat forecast here. Obviously, um, you can't exist in the world without seeing a lot of cessation campaigns. There's really um, a long-term trend of people using less and less tobacco at the same time. Our tax rates have changed over time. Um, hard to forecast, but at the same time, pretty durable um, over time. If we, if we start to see these numbers come down, it would change our opinion maybe about oh. them, but... Um, long, long term, it seems to be flat into the future. Hard to know whether we saw, see cost inflation here. And also one thing we do talk a little bit about when we make this forecast is, are people consuming marijuana and stopping smoking, which is po possible, may maybe even likely, but we don't really see it in the numbers yet. Um, I have a question. I don't have to raise my hand to ask a question. Um, <laughs> Do like e-cigarette vape type products, are they subject to this tax? Is that, yes. they are? They are. Okay. And I, I apologize, I don't, I don't remember. I'd have to look at the code for exactly the, the mathematics of that, but it does include uh, e and vape type products and, and snuff and cigars and all, all kinds of tobacco products are, are included here. Okay, so that, that gets us through uh, all of the revenue forecasts. Um, let me just get myself organized here. So I will talk about property tax next when we talk about the assessor's report and the mill rate. Let's take a break before that. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, we will take yeah, a 10-ish minute break. Okay, we are back and we have <clears throat> covered topics A and B, which I assume are the longest topics and we'll breeze through C through G. So on to C, Assessor Valuation Report, Mr. Rogers. Okay, thank you, Chair Dream. So starting on page um, eight of your packet, you'll see the Assessor's Valuation Report both um, you'll see one, one version of this report for residential and one version for commercial. Uh, we actually did this, we did, did that kind of convenience because we have these on the website. People who own homes want to come and get information about residential and people who own businesses want to come get information about commercial. So we separated it that way. But on page 10, a little more than halfway down, you'll see just a summary of what's happened with property value. So <clears throat> overall residential assessed property value increased 9.21 percent uh hold on i'm hearing reports that our sound is not back on thank you 
Oh, wait, now he says you can hear us. Greg, you're, you can hear us? I can hear you, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, 9.21% um, 9 uh, 9 for residential property from 2021 and 22. And just my, my caution, every time we talk about these numbers, that does not mean that the, the value of every residential property went up 9.21%. It means that some residential properties went up 1% or down 1%, some went up 10, 12, 15%. Um, obviously, there's a lot of information here about what we were seeing in the sales, but I think as important as anything, we just saw it in the world. I mean, we heard from friends and neighbors who were trying to buy um, a house and they would make multiple offers, offer after offer after offer after offer um, with escalating contingencies. Most properties were most properties were selling for in excess of their listing prices. So this is hopefully not surprising to anybody um, that this is what uh, we see in the um, property assessments for residential. Uh, we did see, um, I think. Re reasonably, you can understand that the largest increases that we saw tended to be in the downtown neighborhoods, particularly in the flats, uh, particularly in my neighborhood. Uh, you actually, if I can turn you to the right page of this, there's, oh, I don't, I don't have it. Anyways, doesn't matter. Um, but so that's, that's the residential piece of this. Commercial uh, property increased by 2.31%. And that there is a little more information. I'll, I'll go to page 28 of the packet because um, there's a, a just a, a really simple summary on page 28 of the packet about um, what happened with page 28, yeah, page 28 of the packet of changes that the assessor made. Um, so obviously last year, uh, we made a 50% increase to the base value of all commercial land. That was the effort was to try to bring commercial property more in line with residential property. This year, the effort was to bring commercial properties into better equity with themselves, right? So what we were seeing is that certain properties after that 50% increase were slightly, appeared to be slightly overvalued. Um, and that was downtown. So a 2% decrease to downtown commercial properties. Um, a 2% decrease to boat houses, which just operate really differently. Um, a 2% increases to, to commercial properties outside of downtown. Um, and then a 35% increase to rock dump uh, properties. The industrial property on the rock dump is very valuable. That's been a very uh, sort of hot neighborhood. Um, and we had a couple of sales there that, that clearly indicated that we were not assessing the rock, but we it's 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 just a very popular industrial commercial uh, area of town right now so uh, that's what we see in commercial uh, and residential property assessments um uh for anybody out listening on the airwaves i think that uh the appeal period closes close of business tomorrow um so if you have not um contacted the assessor and filed your appeal you have until the end of the day tomorrow the assessor told me that they um, have a smaller than typical number of appeals, at least as of today. Um, and that could change tomorrow. But um, overall, I think on the residential side, people understand that their property is worth a lot more than it was. And on the commercial side, um, after a year of frustration, I think people are commercial property owners are happy to just see us doing a little bit of minor rebalancing rather than another big change. Any questions about this? This is mostly an FYI. I, wanted to give you the material. Obviously, these reports are lengthy and there is some good information in them. Mr. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Rogers, since we uh, implemented the penalty component to property tax mandatory disclosure, have you seen an increase in um, property disclosures that are being returned to the assessor? in this short period of time? Uh, uh, something more, Bryson, I actually don't know the answer to that, uh, but I will ask. Um, we haven't yet started the process of notifying uh, property owners that they'll be subject to that fine. Uh, it, because of the effective date, it just went into effect a couple of days ago. But now, um, and, and, and now from this point, you still have 90 days. So there, there will be a process before people are compelled via the civil fine to start disclosing that sale price. 
Um, but I will, um, I'll make a note. Okay. I'm gonna show you one more thing, which is on page 14 of the packet, um, which really uh, tries to underscore the reason that we're doing, that we, we make these changes at all to the property values. Um, this one graph uh, is a, just a really good representation of what we're trying to do with assessments. So in assessment year 2020, commercial vacant commercial land the ratios told us that it was assessed for 40% of what it was selling for. In assessment year 2021, <clears throat> the data tells us that it was selling for 60% of, uh, it was assessed for 60% of what it was selling for. And then in, in assessment year 22, it appears to be assessed for a little more than 80% of what it's selling for. So that's the gray line you see move up. All, all of those should be together. There shouldn't be this big outlier. We have made changes and this graph demonstrates that we are closer to having um, vacant commercial land, especially be closer to equity. We will need to continue making efforts over the next couple of years to get all commercial properties up to where we have residential. You'll see residential is the blue line that runs just below one. That means we, we target about 98% value with assessments. We do pretty well at that with residential, at least what we see in the, in the ratio studies. Uh, we just don't do as well with commercial. And we've, the, the changes we've made have helped, um, but it's, it's still hard to get commercial inequity with residential. Okay, any other questions about this? Again, most, mostly an FYI, but important information as we go into talking about property value in the mill rate. Okay, I am going to go to the next page in the packet, which is doesn't have a page number on it, but it is page 38. So page 38 of the packet is, a calc is the calculation of how we look at and think about property tax in, in uh, relative to property valuation. You know, one of the things that happens, and I, I'll just say it for folks who are listening, and, and as you talk to, to your constituents and people in the community, you know, people continue to deep believe very deeply that the assessor raises property value so that we get more property tax. And that just couldn't be further from the truth. Um, we tell people all the time, only the assembly has the authority to set the mill rate. The mill rate determines the property tax. The assessor's job is to make sure that property values are, 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 e are equitable relative to each other. Um, that's the only effort. And then you decide how much tax we should collect. So the manager's proposal. So here you see the taxable assessed valuation uh, at the top. The FY22 valuation, the FY23 valuation, it comes in three groups because we have three different mill rates uh, that we apply. There is a section in the middle there, the 5.2 uh, billion in um, uh, property value. That is the, what, what is roaded, that pays roaded area-wide and fire. Then there is a non-roaded that pays, um, that doesn't, that, 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 that pays fire, but not roaded. And then there's the other roaded without fire, right? So there's, it's complicated in that regard because um, we do have some properties uh, that are remote that don't pay all of our mill rates, but the taxable assessed valuation prior year over year is 6.2%, which is a little different than the numbers that I was just talking to you about because it blends all the commercial and the residential together. Um, then you go down, you can see the mill rate. So the prior year mill rate 6.6, .6, uh, 2.45, 0 0.031, and then 1.2 for debt for a total mill rate of 10.6, uh, 10.56. Ms. Hale, was that you? That was me. Uh, 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 thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, excuse me for interrupting, but I just don't get what that means. A tax taxable assessed valuation increase over prior year Oh, the valuation. So 5.75 million billion or whatever that number is, million is 6.2% over the, okay, got it. Thank you. Correct. That's on Hill. That's correct. Thank you. Sorry. 
and those are in billions. It's always interesting because that's that's the number we work with. Uh, you know, more than five billion. And and just a few years ago, Juno crested over five billion of total valuation. Um, it makes it convenient because at a at a at a at a tell rate mill rate of ten, um, at five billion dollars of property value, you get exactly fifty million dollars of property tax. So we're in this phase where the round numbers are kind of convenient, but we're we'll drift away from those. Um, anyways. You can see um, you can see the property tax in the prior year that was derived. So 55.8 million of property tax in the prior year, meaning this current year, FY22. And then the manager's proposal. So the manager has proposed to take the mill rate back to its uh, sort of historical, recent historical norm of a total of 10.66 by increasing the area wide back to 6.7 as it has been recently, um, 245.31. Uh, oh, keeping the debt service mill rate flat, which we did um, somewhat intentionally by not transferring general funds. This is part of a strategy we talked about a couple of months ago, not transferring general funds in FY22. So the debt service mill rate carries a negative fund balance forward, which we pay off with a 1.2 debt service mill rate. And the property tax that we will um, take in in FY23 uh, totaling just under $60 million, 59.976 million in total property tax. That is a property tax revenue increase in dollars of 4.1 million over the prior year uh, or 7.4%. And then we've given you as a convenience there, a comparison between that, meaning accepting the manager's proposal versus instead keeping the mill rate flat from the prior year. Obviously, you are not constrained to do either of those things. You can set any mill rate you want, um, but I was guessing that you would um, want to at least know what it would look like to, to keep the mill rate flat from the prior year. I made a note in the manager's budget message that the, the budget deficit in FY23 would be about $4 million instead of $3.4 million. So 575,000-ish is about what one-tenth of a mill rate um, equates to. Oh, it's right there, it's on this page, 575. Um, so without that, uh, without the manager having set that tenth of a mill back, you'd have a $4 million deficit instead of a $3.4 million. So I hope that helps make sense. Um, this is just information. I'm happy to answer any questions about it. This is not a decision you make tonight. Um, it's something you can put in your craw and think about where you want to target the mill rate uh, higher or lower as you go through uh, the process. You know, one thing that um, I said jokingly last on Monday night, <coughs> but I, um, I do think it's a reasonable way to think about something. Now that you know that every tenth of a mill gets you $575,000 in property taxes, you can kind of just think about anything you're going to spend money on in those terms, right? So, you know, if a 1% increase to employee wages and a 5% increase to health is probably about $575,000, right? So, so every 1% plus health is going to cost you about a 10th of a mil, right? That's, that's not a, that's not a wrong way to think about it. Really, when you think about just how adding costs to the city budget will require you or some future assembly to set tax rates that pay for it. That's, it's, a, it's fair to look at anything and say, yep, that costs us a 10th of a mil. Yep, that costs us half of a 10th of a mil or, or whatever. Questions about this calculation? Stunned silence. <laughs> Um, okay. I, I stupid question, and I hope there's not too many people online to hear it. Um, why is so the total assessed value the change from the prior year six point two percent? But if we kept the mill rate the same, the change in revenue would be six point four percent. Can you explain why those aren't the same? Yeah, yes. It's the difference of the fact that the different mill rates apply to different portions of that value. And I, I have other versions of this that make that a little more clear. They're just way more complex. It, it's difficult because of that total 5.7 in value, 10.66 doesn't apply to all of it. 
a different rate applies to each one of those three portions. The other thing that I'll point out just as an interesting uh, lark so you can kind of keep score on page, when I showed you the budget summary on page marked DOC2, you'll see property tax growth over the prior year of 3.2 million. And that's different than what's here. And the difference is that um, debt, right? So the debt service mill rate doesn't ever go to the general fund. It goes to the debt service fund. So not all of that 4.1 that you see on this comes back into the general fund budget. A portion of that is paying additional amounts of debt. Okay, let me, let me just, just because it's in your packet, interestingly, um, this is the long-term history of the CBJ mill rate. Probably, I'd probably make this a little bigger. People can see it better. Um, this graph, uh, I, we, I like including, I think it gives you a little bit of context uh, about where the mill rate has been. The mill rate was only lower than it is today for a couple of years, 2007, eight, nine, 2010 sort of starts the long-term trend where it basically stays flat from then to now, little ups and downs, and then it settles into the 10.66 pattern. Um, but prior to 2007, the mill rate was just higher. Um, we had mill rates uh, into the 11s and 12s in those years. So we've settled into this pattern of a flat mill rate. Lots of reasons why that happens. Uh, there are, I think, certainly parties who would say that's crazy. The mill rate shouldn't be flat like that. Other people would say, no, it's good. It's dependable. Um, it doesn't allow city expenditures to rise too fast, et cetera. Um, it just, just interesting that this has been the history. There has been a clear preference on behalf of the assembly and management, I think, to just flat mill rate. Um, and uh, the next is the debt service model. So I'm not going to get that to you. Okay, so that was, I think that's all I've got on the mill rate for now. Any questions about that for mill rate property taxes generally, how it connects to assessments? Well, good luck. Yeah, Mr. Rogers, just curious. Um, I would I would guess here, but um, maybe you can tell me more uh, clearly, does this kind of fall in line with higher mill rates being uh, attributed to years when our, um, property rates weren't so high and, and maybe now we're, we're a lower rate because property rates are so high. Yeah, assembly member will it up. I think that that is a, a good presumption. I, I certainly don't know why mill rates were set that high in the, in the late nineties and early thousands. Um, but I think that that's a fair, I mean, that's a fair guess, right? If property values in those years were lower, the assembly would have had to set higher mill rates. Um, one thing that's interesting, if you look at the long-term history of the area-wide versus roaded versus fire, is that the, well, you can see it here, the roaded used to be a bigger portion. And it was, made, it was made smaller over the years and area-wide got bigger. And the reason for that, that trend is that we got more property tax by doing that over time. Um, it made sense that the assembly could keep a flat mill rate by moving a 10th from roaded to area-wide over and over and over again. And you were getting incrementally little bits more revenue because more property was being taxed. That's just an interesting phenomenon you see really clearly in this graph is that roaded has gotten to be a smaller part and area-wide took up the slack. But I think that's a fair, fair guess that property values could have been lower in those years and they needed higher mill rates. Mr. Bryson, did I see your hand? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Rogers, I thought the, those increased mill rates and, and I'm trying to find the information here and I'm not seeing it, um, was because we had a higher debt service during that time period. Um, Somebody remember Bryce, but I don't know that for a fact. Forty-nine of the budget book. So let's let's go there. Um, you can see the debt service portion of the mill rate here in blue, the little blue at the top, and it's relatively consistent over that period. But if you want to see those numbers, you can look at page forty-nine of the budget book, which is the long-term history of the mill rates. And so the debt service mill rate in those years was a little bit higher, but marginally. Like it got as high as 1.52 in 2000, 
but you know the area wide and roaded mill rates were also historically quite high at the same time. <clears throat> Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Hale and then Ms. Glashewski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Rogers, I, I might just be muddling things, but when we look at a total number for a mill rate, um, and it relates back to the question that Ms. Treem had about the 6.4 versus 6.2%. Um, so we, we look at the mill rate, those numbers, if, if we had a 10.66 applied back in 1998, uh, it would generate different amounts of revenue, right? Because of the roaded percentage. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like the total mill rate number, does that actually translate? Is that like a, like right now we're using it as a multiplier by the assessed value, but is that accurate given, I don't, I guess I don't understand the relationship between that total mill rate number and these different categories. So when we look at today's 10.66, is it truly comparable to 1998's 11.89? Um, Assembly Member Harrell, it's not comparable in all kinds of ways, in part because val properties have changed too, right? Um, so look at so looking at this table, that 5.2 billion up there that's listed as roaded in FY23 valuation, that 5.2 billion worth of property pays 10.66. The 29 million of a much, 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 much smaller number pays roaded, but without fire. So they pay area-wide, they pay roaded, they don't pay the 0 0.31, they do pay debt service. So that's what they pay. And then the non-roaded also means non-fire. I should fix this, but um, the non-roaded non-fire doesn't only pays area-wide and debt. So for example, if you own a property on Shelter Island, you don't pay roaded or fire, you pay area-wide plus debt. That's your mill rate. 7.9 is your mill rate out there. Thank you. So I'm just gonna follow up on that question. So if we're talking about maybe our typical homeowner or commercial landowner, they're always paying the full mill rate and we can, typically always paying the full mill rate and they were always paying the full mill rate in 1998, right? So we can that, kind of compare those two that's situations. Yep. Uh, Ms. Gladshevsky. I was just gonna say that one reason to the area wide, the mines pay area wide. So that's a reason you would increase the area wide number because the mines pay that. So I'm sure that's happened over time. Okay, good. Any more questions on property tax, the mill rate, the connection of the two? We're gonna come back to this subject in the future, but. Okay. Next, I think we're gonna talk about debt. Okay, so just uh, two pages forward in your packet, not in the budget book, but in your packet. Um, this is the table we've again tried to show this kind of format somewhat consistently. You can see two years of actuals, FY2021, 20, the projected FY22 year. You can see our total net required debt service. That's the sum of all of our required general obligation debts um, offset by any amounts that are paying those debts other than the general funds. So just to look at the FY23 column. Okay, so tracking down from um, first, we have agreed to start FY23 with a negative $2 million fund balance. Then we have 8.8 .8 million of required general obligation debt service. And then the, the sum of those two things, which is 8.8 .8 plus 2 million, so about 10.8, they get reduced by uh, school bond debt reimbursement from the state of Alaska, and they get reduced by the airport based on the conversation we had about the airport in FY23 and 24 paying its general obligation debt service. 
um, uh, uh, from its, uh, its ARPA funding. And then a hotel bed tax subsidy, I shouldn't really call that a subsidy, I might change that word. That's the, that's the 2% of hotel bed tax from 7% to 9% that is paying off the general obligation bond that was issued for Centennial Hall. So that's another portion that counts to your credit here. So the net required debt service in this year is $4.9 million. And the debt service that is paid by a 1.2 million, 1.2 mil rate is 6.9, which corrects your $2 million negative fund balance. Did that math make enough sense? Okay. So the net required debt service is about 5 million. We, for a 1.2 debt service mill rate flat from last year, we get 6.9 million in uh, property tax, debt service property tax, which is also on this page if you're keeping score and connecting one thing to another. Um, and that 6.9 million of debt service property tax pays for 5 million of current year debt and $2 million of this year's debt that we're pushing forward. Did that all make sense? <laughs> okay, yeah. all right. Oh, wait, uh, Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Mr. Rogers, as you just pointed out that we pushed $2 million of debt service forward, would it be possible for us to push a million of that into next year? If we have a 6.9, almost $7 million debt service or, and we're trying to correct the 1.9 from last year, but next year we only owe $4 million of debt service, couldn't we just stretch out that $2 million repayment? So that way we're not putting as much pressure on it this year? Assembly member Bryson, I, I don't know why you couldn't do that. I, so, so, so yes, you could choose to do that. Thank you. But we are also talking about more debt and at least, you know, we're talking about city hall, talking about other things we might bond for that would be there next year or could be if we decide. Chair Treem, just let me take one more shot at walking through this because I think it just helps to hear it out loud. <clears throat> so in FY23, the required debt service, that's the amount of principal and interest that we pay on all of our general obligation debts, 8.8 .8 million. And then that 8.8 .8 million that we would pay from general funds is reduced by 2.8 million that we get from the state. It's reduced by 660,000 that we get from the airport. And it's reduced by 464,000 that we get from the hotel bed tax fund which means that from general fund property tax, we need to pay $4.9 million. However, keeping the mill rate flat at 1.2 generates 6.9 million of property tax to pay debt, which pays off $5 million of current year general obligation debt, the 4.9, and it retires the $2 million negative fund balance that we chose to carry forward from 22 to 23. I know it helps to just, I look at this thing all the time, but I know you don't. <laughs> Ms. Hale. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I know people are probably tired of talking about this, but I'd like to raise this airport uh, reimbursement uh, uh, issue again, if I may. I, I, maybe I missed this meeting, but I really don't remember voting on this. And I, I know that it has caused some serious consternation. And um, I guess I just, I mean, I, I, is this a dead issue for the assembly? Um, because it, 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 it thank you. Um, Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Chair. So just to refresh everyone's memory, no, it's not a dead issue. Uh, the Assembly can choose uh, whatever whatever it likes. So when uh, we were preparing the budget, uh, we, we looked at this and uh, we communicated with the uh, airport manager and we said, we think the airport should pay this portion of the debt because you have that large fund balance of uh, ARPA funds. Uh, and the airport manager said, mm, okay, well, 
uh, it would be good if you told us that that's what the assembly wanted to do. So we brought it to the finance committee. We said, here's our recommendation. Uh, the finance committee agreed. Subsequently, we had the meeting with the airport board and the airport board pushed back and said, we'd like to uh, make our pitch on why you shouldn't do that. Um, so you heard that and we had already uh, prepared the budget uh, or were preparing it in accordance with that January uh, recommendation that the finance committee accepted. There's no reason during the budget that the assembly couldn't reverse course. Thank you. Ms. Gladyshevsky. So just to track which, <laughs> now you've gone around, I've gone around in a circle. Um, which version is this table? The, the January version or the we're not sure version? And then I have another question. Uh, Chair Trim, so this version is the January version. Okay, where, and, where and, we're asking the airport to fund that. Correct. Okay. And if the assembly wanted to do something different, you would just at some point in the budget process make an amendment. Yep. Okay, so the real question I had before that was um, this 1.9, I get the math, right? That we need 4.9, but we're going to get 1.99 more than we need. Where in um, is the line that we carried 2 million from last year. That's where I don't, I don't know where that one is. I get that what the math is on this, on the 23 column. Yep. Where's the two, where's the equivalent 1.9 and 22? Yeah, thank you. So what you, you see it at the the very top of this row is the debt service balance that's being carried for. Ah, okay, I got that's it. That's a negative 1.9. You can also see it at the bottom of the FY2 column, and this is the spreadsheet's a little complicated because it allows you to set different mill rates, but you see a required general fund subsidy of $2.8 million. That's the amount that finance calculates that you would be required to subsidize from the general fund. And then this voluntary general fund subsidy, which is what we actually did of 824.8. And the difference of those two things is the 1.9. Holy moly, okay. That we've chosen to carry forward. Okay, uh, Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm also following the math and I know we talked about it, but can you remind me the rationale for making that decision to <laughs> carry that into the next yeah. year? Yeah, good, Somebody Member Wall, good question. So the rationale was, was <laughs> two remember? things. One, it, it just saved the assembly, it saved CBJ $2 million of general funds in the, in the real world. Right. It just saved you two million dollars of general funds in this year, because otherwise you would have had to transfer two million dollars of general funds into the debt service fund to pay that. And in the budget summary at the back of the budget book, you'll see you get that credit back. It's the thing where it says lapsed a one point nine million dollars. Right. So so it's really two million dollars that stays in fund balance. The other reason, and I and I think it's OK for us to, to just talk about really openly. So now we look at this graph. Had you not done that, the debt service mill rate in 23 would have fallen considerably, you know, down about to where it goes in FY24. That would have been fine, but there was no particularly good reason to let that happen because you could preserve $2 million of general funds and keep the debt service mill rate flat into FY23. So that was the conversation I think we had in February in committee, maybe. Um, and and I hope I explained it well enough then. And again, you don't have to make that decision. If instead, I mean, during this process, you could still decide that you'd rather spend the $2 million in general funds this year and let the debt service mill rate fall like it would naturally next year. That, that is an option you still have. I think we're definitely gonna talk about it again. Ms. Hale. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I'd like to go back to the proposal to increase the, the area-wide mill rate from 6.7 or 6.6 to 6.6, 6.7. Um, understanding that that increase reflects revenue of 575,000, um, can I, ask for the rationale in making that increase. 
Mr. Manager. Uh, Chair, Chair Trim, uh, sim simply uh, the, the gulf between revenues and expenditures. Uh, I tried to um, make that gap a little smaller. If the assembly likes a different number, you can, you can choose a different number. So in, in some sense, uh, I was being conservative uh, and leaving that decision to the assembly to contemplate. Thank you. So this chart is far, uh, exhilarated. I don't know. <laughs> it actually, it's okay, I like it. It was enough of something to, to prompt Mr. Mertz to text me and say, whoa, death service. <laughs> um, uh, it, this is really significant. I, I don't, I mean, I have to go back a long time probably to, to figure out if an assembly saw a debt service that plummeted like this in the same way. Um, I don't know that I could tell you all the reasons why it's happening so precipitously, but one of them is that we stopped issuing school debt because of the moratorium. You know, had the moratorium not happened and had we been able to continue relying on school bond debt, previous assemblies would have issued more school debt, probably. Um, and so in the absence of, of issuing more school debt, the debt service mill rate just is, is going to fall off a cliff here. Um, it is my guess that this assembly oh, and future assembly. Mr. Rogers, your microphone is off. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, uh, what should I say uh, to get people caught up? I'm sorry, for, at least for Mr. Smith. So um, this is an, uh, you know, kind of a staggering decrease in the debt service mill rate. Um, the fact that we are no longer issuing uh, school debt because of the moratorium is probably one of the reasons that we see it fall off so precipitously. We, I mean, it happens this way because we haven't been issuing enough new debts, or I shouldn't say enough. There's no reason to be in debt, but if the overall goal was to have the debt service mill rate sort of stay the same over a long period of time, which for the last many decades it has, um, you have to keep issuing new debts. And that's just one of the way that municipalities pay for what they do. Um, so I think the, the upshot of all of this is that um, the assembly has headroom uh, capacity to issue really significant amounts of debt in the coming years. One of the things that I was trying to explain to the chair is that you know, we, we can structure a debt in any way to absorb as much or as little uh, debt uh, service mill rate capacity as we want. More in the first year, less in the second, just interest for a few years. I mean, we can front load it or back load it. We can do a lot of things that are creative um, in, in terms of how we wanna pay for our debt over time. Um, so, you know, I think, I think I think it would I think it will be wise to retain a flat debt service mill rate coming into FY23 in anticipation of voters potentially endorsing one or more debt service funded projects this fall, and we will structure that debt in such a way to keep, continue keeping the debt service mill rate flat at least for 24, and there will still be plenty of capacity after that for other assemblies. I mean, really. Like in big round numbers, this assembly could probably issue a hundred million dollars of debt. I mean, that's that number is not out of the realm of possibility without increasing the debt service mill rate. Not to say that you're going to do that or that the voters would endorse it, but that's the kind of, that's the kind of capacity. <laughs> Mr. Watt, uh, Chair Trim. So earlier when we were discussing the um, mill levy over time and how we got to this flat you know 1066 or 1076 or whatever 1055 um, mill levy um, I, when I became city manager I thought that was curious and with the outgoing city manager and the prior finance director uh, I said why, why do we talk about the mill levy because it's really mill levy times valuation and really the effect on uh, private citizens, whether individuals or businesses, it's the amount of money that they pay for government services uh, and the effects of inflation. And then I said, why aren't we really talking about 
you know, last year, so if I look in this, last year we took 55.8 million of property tax and this year 59 point or 60 million of property tax. Why don't we, why don't we talk about that cost rather than the rate? And, and I'll be honest, everybody kind of looked at me and just nobody liked that idea. And so I, I asked people in the community, I asked, I asked liberals, I asked conservatives, I asked centrists and really I was surprised. I thought, I thought it made sense to look at the actual cost and the actual expenditure. Um, and what I learned is that across the board, a lot of people liked that predictability. Um, they liked that predictability of, of rate um, and that the valuation of their property or, or, or commercial property, home or whatever, you know, kind of was their business, but they liked that predictability of rate. So it's, a, I think it's a little bit of a, a cultural shift that happened to us as a municipality um, sometime in the early 2000s. And, and I, I can't quite figure out how, when or why that happened, but it seems to work for people. All right, I'm gonna to torture you with one more um, chart because I love this chart. <laughs> I love it because it makes me think of some strange animal. Um, um, so this is a chart of the amount of debt service in dollars that we've paid since 1998. Um, and the red portion is schools the green portion at the bottom is sort of general CBJ CIPs. And then the blue portion is the pool. And in this part, in this case, obviously it's Diamond Park. Um, so what you can see here is that, you know, we had a lot of school bond debt in 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And that is nearly paid off by the time you get to all the way to the right side of the chart. So, so part of, the, again, the reason that the debt service no rate is going down so precipitously is because we've paid off all of our school debts and we have not issued new ones and we have not issued new ones because of the moratorium. Um, the two orange spikes that you see in terms of cost are unreimbursed school bond debt. You know, just these massive anomalies that are the result of, um, of inconsistent uh, legislative appropriations for school bond debt. And then tracked separately on this, you can just see the, how the mill rate tracked over time, the debt service mill rate. Again, a little bit like everything else, it used to move up and down a lot more. And now we've settled into this um, downward pattern from 1.5 in both of 15 and 16 down to 1.4, 1.3, 1.3, and then settling into this 1.2 pattern, which, you know, even I tonight have, encouraged you to continue keeping it flat. So um, if I'm curious about why it has gotten flat and stayed flat, it's because people like me recommended that you do that. Um, I just think this is a really good picture of, 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 of what debts we've paid over time uh, relative to each other. And just the vast majority of it is school debt. And because we're no longer issuing new school debts, um, the debt service no rate just falls in a really precipitous way. Questions about this or the last? Um, Mr. Watt, I'll have you jump in and then Ms. Yuskandis, Ms. Gladyshevsky, Ms. Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I just want to talk about school funding a little bit. Um, I think when you look at when you look at this chart, uh, you probably in your brain, you're thinking there's a very real scenario where moving forward, uh, we're going to be uh, paying three or four or five tenths of a mill um, of debt uh, for school projects. Um, thinking back many years uh, when we had uh, a lot of school projects in the early 2000s, the then assembly um, annually would make an appeal to the school district. And it was a little bit of a collegial joke. And the, the, the finance chair, Mr. Bush, would say, you know, we want to support you and we like your projects, but it'd be really nice if you could help us keep a, a flat debt uh, uh, level for school projects and and you know and the school district would say we've got old facilities and we've got this program and we can leverage 70 percent state money and you know it's equity across the school district so that we have you know similarly uh, uh, 
um, fitted out schools for all our students. And so it was just, it was a little, you know, push and pull between the assembly and the school district uh, where the schools were advocating for uh, the well-being of their facilities and and the assembly was questing after this idea of a, a flat mill levy. Uh, but as Mr. Rogers just showed with that school debt coming down, um, we haven't taken on new debt like we used to in the 7030 projects. We have funded schools, you know, with infusions of sales tax, or we did do the small bond two years ago, or we do have the supplemental coming through. Uh, and the school facilities, joint school facilities committee uh, kind of grapples with that. What's the right level of funding for uh, school facilities and how are we going to do it? And, and certainly this is one piece of that puzzle. Okay, um, Ms. Gladyshevsky. A technical question about the this is only what years are these two i love this graph by the way i'm, I'm with you um this looks like it's 17 and 21 these two little um uh, horns um assembly member i i would have to look back at the underlying data but i actually think what you're seeing is that um the second horn is actually 21 and 22 and then the first horn is 17. Okay, because I, I thought it was more than two is all I was what I thought there was more than two. Yeah, there is more than two. What you're seeing in that large horn up in the front is actually two, uh, two or maybe even three years. Okay, and we don't know there's is, is this little gold thing hospital or something or is, and that's all done? Or what's the enterprise one? <laughs> yeah, the tail, the gold tail. <laughs> It's, uh, I was trying to get it. No, are you at, are you trying to remember what the gold thing is? Hospital, wasn't it? And then we don't Mr. have it. That's it. We're, we are paid it off. Uh, Chair Cream, it, it was hospital. So when that when uh, Bartlett did its big expansion, um, the the assembly agreed to fund. Yeah. Uh, I think 20 million of debt for the hospital expansion. So there's 20 million of revenue that was paid by the hospital and 20 million that uh, the assembly agreed to pay. Uh, and then the project grew to 65 million with the remainder coming out of the hospital fund balance. Um, and and that would have been the 2005 project that didn't exactly get done by 2000. <laughs> and we're done though. I mean, obviously we're done paying that. That's over. Long done. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I see a triceratops like from behind. That's what I see. Yeah. Yeah, very dinosaur. <laughs> um, Ms. Hale. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So in the head, the big bulk of the triceratops, that that reddish bulk of it, are there new schools in there? Is there new school funding or was Some that? Hill, yes. Yes. Thunder Mountain High School. That's what I thought. Yeah. And I guess I would just say that we're probably not going to be in the business of building any new schools for quite a while. So that's a good thing. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Okay. Are we good to move on? Have we wound down from the animal graph? <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, okay. The last thing on the agenda is um, to look at to just not really look at just just brief information item you might presume on cost allocation so every year uh what happens is that the enterprises come before you and they tell you how much their allocated costs have increased and that and that really is happening it's it's happening every year um as cbj general fund expenses go up for all the reasons that they go up we allocate you know that proportional cost out to the enterprises that use um, those services. And so on pages uh, 43, on pages 43 through 47, you see the cost allocation broken out by um, who is paying and what they're paying for. And then on pages 49 through 52, it's broken out. It's the same exact information, but it's broken out by who is performing that service and who's paying for it. So, so in any event, at the top of this page, you see the school district pays those costs. The school district does not pay very much in allocated costs. They have an independently elected body. They don't, they don't use very many of our services, but they do use a few. 
Um, for example, the law requires them to use our central treasury. Um, and they use certain other things. They use the attorney's office. You see those things there. But then you also see the airport, the hospital, docks and harbors, um, all of the enterprises and funds that use CBJ services and they are required to pay for them. Um, for those of you who maybe don't think about this very often, lands, for example, is a fund that has staff. So uh, Mr. Blydorn and his staff um, exist in the lands fund. The lands fund does pay for the services it uses, uh, central services, just like the enterprises do. We don't think of lands as an enterprise. It's not, but um, as a fund, it does pay those costs. Um, I just wanted to give you a view of this so that you can have these materials at your, at, you know, at your fingertips when when somebody comes to you and says, "Oh, our allocated costs are really, really crazy." Um, you know, just the other day um, in an Eagle Crest meeting, Mr. Scanlon had said, "Oh, we pay for library services we don't use," and I immediately wrote him and said, "Mr. Scanlon, if there are library costs you don't use, you shouldn't be paying for them. That's a mistake." And we tracked it back, and no, it was it is correct. Uh, it's their website. So their website is maintained by staff of the library. We were to track that back and see what the metric was and talk about what that metric was and talk about the cost being allocated, all that. So we do use these tools for education all the time with the enterprises about why their allocated costs are what they are. What, something that's not reflected here are the risk rates. So insurance, health insurance rates, all of that separate the rate setting is a separate process, both for um, the risk fund and for building maintenance, separate from full cost. The full cost allocation only applies to the central service agencies, including the attorney, the manager, the clerk, um, all of the finance department uh, sections, emergency services, HR. Uh, when you see the library here on, on here, it's mostly for web services because most of the CBJ websites are maintained through the library. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions about this. Oh, Adrian made a note here for me. I appreciate it. One of the things we've, so we contracted, we started as an, out, as an outcome of the CBJ CLIA settlement, we hired a cost allocation consultant in principle to work on the marine passenger fee allocation. However, it made sense to us to also have them work on what we call the full cost allocation, which is the allocation of CBJ costs out to the enterprises and funds. So we do use a third party cost allocation consultant to do a lot of this work for us. One of the things that we've worked with them, on, we've had them now for three years. And one of the things that we've done this year for the first time is that we've smoothed that cost. So now we're going to start using three years of allocations and we take that three year average and we will do that. We'll continue that smoothing because one of the things that happens is allocated costs can go up and down quite rapidly, depending on how much services an enterprise used in the previous years. So the smoothing helps to just level that out and it will make the enterprise budgeting a little more consistent year to year without such bigs up and downs. And we've talked already about Eagle Crest tonight. Eagle Crest got hit pretty hard one year with a big increase in allocated costs because it had used a lot of city services. Well, that's hard for them to plan for. Um, so a smoothing will have them pay the same amount over a long period of time, but it'll, it'll take out the peaks and valleys. So we're starting to do that. That'll be better for everybody. Did you have a question, Ms. Hill? Yes, I did. Oh, Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Rogers, uh, could that possibly dissuade a department to not use city services? Could the fact that we're charging attorney's fees to every city department make a, de a department manager say, well, let's not call the manager or the manager or the attorney on this. Let's just do what we want to do and not take on this cost. Yeah, I, uh, Assemblymember Bryson, I think that is exactly right. I think it can dissuade, but w just one quick thought. General funded city department. Reason is simple. They're already funded by the general fund. The central service agencies are funded by the general fund. It doesn't matter. So the only agencies that are paying that allocated cost are the enterprises and the funds. I do think it's possible that they would curtail their use of services to some degree um, to limit those costs. But I think in practice, I don't really know that they do or that they could. Um,
Mr. Watt. Uh, Mr. Palmer and I do a lot of education with the enterprise uh, departments that if they um, consult early, particularly with the attorney, uh, it saves them a lot of time. Uh, and if they consult early with the manager on uh, process issues, moving things through the assembly, it will also save them a lot of time. And they, they generally come to accept that. Uh, maybe in the heat of the moment, it's not the most popular message, um, but we constantly um, are at work on that. Sure, Trim, I'll just make one other little note, and I, I'm not trying to pick on Eagle Crest at all. It seems like we pick on Eagle Crest all the time, but there, it's it's an it's it's easily understood thing to talk about. Um, Eagle Crest is uh, always trying to figure out how to pay for itself, and it's difficult, right? Um, Eagle Crest is frequently frustrated about the amount of allocated cost it pays. Understandably, what will happen, strangely, is that two years from now in FY24, Eagle Crest will see huge allocated costs from the manager's office and the attorney and to some degree from finance. Why? Because buying a gondola from Austria is really complicated. And I and Mr. Palmer and Mr. Watt and others and others in purchasing and engineering have spent a ton of time on it. And what will happen is that Eagle Crest will pay for that time two years from now. And they will not surprisingly be surprised and frustrated by all that cost. Um, so I empathize with Mr. Scanlon, I empathize with the enterprises. It's hard to know that you're incurring all the central service costs when you're incurring it, and then you pay for it several years later. Um, the smoothing will help that to some degree, but um, you know, these, the, the enterprises do consume central services just like everybody else does, um, sometimes really significantly, so, especially for something complicated like buying a gondola from another country. I can't wait to sit through those budget meetings. But um, <laughs> one more question about, I think it would just be apply to Eagle Crest. This says full cost allocation. Is that 85% for Eagle Crest or 100%? Chair Tree, but it's still 85% for Eagle Crest. But it's 100% for all the rest of them. Correct. Okay. Any more questions on cost allocation? No, I see none. Okay, our schedule, our calendar is the last page of the packet. Um, Mr. Rogers, do you want to say anything about that? No, I don't. I, I don't want to say anything about the calendar, but I'm going to make one note on today's on the calendar for today. You see an investment update that I didn't do. And I'll just share 60 seconds on it. CBJ's investments have done terribly in the last several months. And this was totally predictable. In fact, I think I've told you this train doesn't last forever. So we've seen really significant investment losses, not just poor performance, but investment losses. And that happened because interest rates have started to gone up. I mean, the minute that the Federal Reserve announced seven quarter point increases, um, the value of our investment portfolio just plummeted. And that's just totally what happens with fixed income. I will prepare for this committee at some point during the budget process, a summary of what is likely to happen in 22, meaning current year, and what we think happens in 23. And I'll try and put it in context of our big investment returns last year and the year before. Because I don't know if you remember me saying it, but the, the term of art in the fixed income industry is pulling returns forward. We were pulling returns forward into those years and now we're paying the piper. Over time, it evens out and I'll try to show you that, but we will have significant investment losses, not just under performance, losses, real general funds that we will lose in FY22 that will reduce fund balance, both in the general fund and especially for the hospital, but you have to look at them in context of what our investment performance has been over a couple of years. Um, so we will do that. Um, I didn't have the information or the time to get that ready for tonight, um, like I had hoped, but we'll, we'll put that on the calendar at some point. Just know that that's gonna come. Ms. Hughes-Gandies. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one sort of general bit pertains to the Finance Committee, but looking at this calendar overall, 
the last time we talked about um, how we are going to fit in uh, sales tax on food. Obviously, that plays a big part in all of our financial decisions. That's at the very next one. Okay, thanks. Mr. Watt. Just to go to the order update, there was a little bit of a landslide on North Douglas Highway north of the boat ramp that blocked the road. Don't believe anybody was injured and DOT is out there cleaning it up. Oh. So yeah, uh, just while, while we've been meeting. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, okay. there's, uh, we have pictures if you want to see them. It's minor excitement. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, we are adjourned. See you next week. Mm -hmm. Thank you.